Good morning and welcome to today's update. It's uh, spring weather now um, and markets are still being fairly volatile. So I want to go through two things today, just go through a bit of the market context and also a bit of a strategy update on the, on the whiteboard. Um, and our markets, uh, as always, uh, are a bit unpredictable. Um, I just want to put into some context around um, you know, the, what they call bull and bear markets. You hear this in the press a lot, what is a bull market, what's a bear market? And really over time, the fascinating thing about markets is that no one really knows when markets are going to fall or when they're going to rise. And that's what makes it tricky, and that's what makes it so interesting, but also makes it a bit nerve wracking. So as you know, we have a very well structured, well thought out investment philosophy. It's been really tested now for decades and decades and decades. We know it works, but we also know that when you're sitting at home and you're watching the news, it can make you nervous. So, we are here, please always always call if you want to chat about it. But just to put in perspective, this is a, about the cycle of the past. Uh, this goes back to 1980, up to the current day, and shows when there's been what they call a bull year, so a positive year is, is, is what the, the media talks about bulls as being the, the good years. Um, and the percentage return of bulls, uh, 152%, 608%, 1,213%, 342%. So they're the rises, that's the increases when there's been a, a, a positive time, and then the negative um, periods were minus 33, minus 43, minus 48, and minus 27. So in total, there's 38.5 total bull years, 38 years since 1980, and only 3.8 bear years. So as we know, the, the bear years are nerve-wracking, but they're actually relatively few uh, but, but compared to the bull years, so the good years. So there's less bad years, um, the bad years aren't normally as bad as the good years, but when they're happening, uh, our emotions, everything gets involved, and of course the media love to talk about it more, a lot more than when they do when there's good market. So hang in there, uh, the investment process and the philosophy uh, does work through these periods, uh, but we know it's a bit nerve wracking and that's, that's why we're here. So I was just going to touch on uh, another thing because we often get asked the question then, I'll just skim through this, as you can see, courtesy of Vanguard, these slides, and here's the next one, well, down a bit. Our sophisticated studio here. I think that's it. Now this one's got a lot of numbers on it, you won't be able to read it all, but the point is, this is the best returning market in 2004, uh, which was actually Australian shares, 28.7%, and that'll be the worst. So the worst in 2004 was cash, 2.3%. And then it follows it from best to worst every year. So 2004 all the way up to 2021, Again, in 2021, the best uh, actually was international shares and the worst was bonds. But the point is, because we often get asked, well, what's going to happen next? What's the next best asset class? And if we look at that, and then there's just there's no real pattern. There's no way of knowing which asset class is going to be best year on year. Uh, and it's often one that's unexpected. So um, again, it's just that matter of diversification. But having, having a diversified portfolio, make sure that we've got exposure to the good assets, and we've got, there's obviously some exposure to assets that can be negative in here as well. That happens in any portfolio. But the alternative of trying to pick and choose is very, very difficult. And it's very, very difficult. In fact, there's no evidence to show that anyone can reliably time things and move in and out of asset classes, let alone individual stocks over time and add much value. So we come back to the fundamentals, we come back to the asset class approach, we come back to making sure you've got enough cash and fixed interest and you shouldn't have to worry about it, hopefully you're not. So that's a bit on the market update. I just want to have a bit of a quick strategy update as well. The whiteboard today. Um, exciting thing that, oh, I'm a bit close to that, sorry. Now that might be a bit glary, but just on superannuation, there's been some big changes and, um, and we have been talking about it a little bit, but just in case you haven't heard about it, uh, particularly for retirees, again, just adjusting the camera there. So I like to draw the picture of, I've got super, What happens when you retire or you hit a certain age? You can start what's called a pension pension account. So with super, now super funds typically pay 15% on their earnings. And in the current rules, you can have up to $1.7 million per person in a super fund that pays 0% tax. You can have more than 1.7 million, but when you retire, the 1.7 million is tax-free. That's pretty good, 3.4 million of uh, a tax-free asset uh, typically when you're over 60 that can start. 
So what's changed recently is you used to have to meet a work test to get the money into super up to 65. So 65 was a crucial age, and then they changed up to 67, and good news is they've now changed up to 75. So that means you can get money into super without having to meet a work test up until age 75. And that means if you've got less than 1.7 million in your super funds, and there's some money outside of super for whatever reason, you might have downsized, so you can put money into super from a house sale, you might just have some savings outside of super, you can get that money into super and get it into this tax-free environment. And the only catch is that you have to draw it out money. So it starts at a minimum of 4%. Because of COVID, that's even half, now it's only 2%. But normally it's 4% up to age 65, then 5% up to age 75 and so on, and it increases slightly. So again, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world markets, but this strategy of maximising super, getting as much in here and having this tax-free, Australia's unique. It's probably one of the only legal tax havens in the world. It's really important. Um, that we look at this and we make sure that you're maximising the benefits of this system, which is pretty good. Now, the government's talking about making some tweaks again, of course they are, but at the moment, this basic system is expected to stay. The limits of 1.7 might be 